Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Air Commodore Blythe Crawford, Commandant of the Royal Air Force's Air and Space Warfare Centre. Uh, if any of you have a problem uh, with the accent, I'm sure one of the panel will be able to uh, translate on my behalf. But uh, I'm delighted today to, be, uh, to welcome all you all to this uh, panel on weapons and munitions and the challenges that we are facing um, with addressing these in the future. I'll introduce our illustrious panel in a moment, but by way of introducing the theme, I'll say a few words just to contextualize the scenario we are faced with today. But as we gather here this week, the world is facing one of its most turbulent times in history. Since Putin's letter back in December 21, where he detailed his aspirations for a new world order, we have seen our adversaries emboldened to take, to take action, beginning with the invasion of Ukraine in February. This conflict will be marked in history as one where a democratic state fighting for its freedom and supported by the free world was faced with invasion from an increasingly autocratic Russia, seizing strategic opportunity, enhanced by a global pandemic, political shifts in the West, and a withdrawal from Afghanistan. The first real conflict where Western weaponry has had to directly approve its mettle against contemporary, but also supposedly modern Russian weapons. It has become a lesson in tactics, resilience, logistics, and strategy, to say the least. Watching with keen interest, the Chinese then sought to reaffirm their claim over Taiwan, escalating a long-term crisis, and where if conflict occurred, we could see an untested but seemingly very capable Chinese force pitted again against Western weaponry. Each of these crises have also forced us to address our resilience and supply chains. Tom Mankin recently recorded that the US needs a new approach to producing weapons, where whilst they have played an increasingly important role in halting Moscow's initial offensive, it has become increasingly apparent that such weapons are neither cheap nor available in unlimited numbers. The effectiveness of precision weaponry against invading forces has been impressive, but has also highlighted the fact that the current US munitions infrastructure is not robust enough to support a high intensity, protracted conflict against a major adversary such as Russia or China. Similarly, our technical advantage looks increasingly vulnerable as both Russia and China test a new range of weapons, hypersonics being a classic example, though the effectiveness of these on the battlefield is still unproven. We have similarly seen our adversaries conduct trials in space, although not officially weaponized yet, but where they are showing considerable prowess and interest. And of equal consequence, we have seen off-the-shelf drones with rudimentary munitions take on the vast field of Russian armor with great effect on the battlefield. So what does this mean for our force mix of the future? So these are all challenging problems which must drive us to think and act faster and more effectively than before, within General Brown's slogan of accelerate, change, or lose. So I'm privileged to be allowed to draw on some of the country's experts in this field, who I'm sure can help us address some of these questions and others. So I'd like to start by introducing Major General Steve Sargent, retired, who has been CEO of Marvin Test Solutions since 2012. General Sargent previously served as the commander of the Air Force Operational Test and Evaluation Center, the 56th and 8th Fighter Wings, and was commandant of the USAF Weapons School. We've also got John Snooze Martin, director of international programs at MBDA. Snooze served in the Navy, flying F-14s as a Top Gun instructor and TPS graduate, and as a program manager in the F-18, F-35, and the Air to Air Missile Program offices. And finally, Steve Milano, Director of Air to Service Effects at Raytheon Missiles and Defense. Steve leads Air to Service Requirements and Capabilities Development for Raytheon Missiles and Defense Air Power Mission Area, and his portfolio also includes various existing weapon systems, as well as emerging capabilities like open system architectures and collaborative autonomy. So again, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome such an illustrious uh, panel um, to the stage. And uh, maybe General Sargent, do you like to kick off uh, the discussion? Well, thanks very much, and I uh, really appreciate two things. One, the warm introduction for all of us, and two, you and all your colleagues from the United Kingdom being here during a very solemn time back home. And we appreciate the sacrifice you make being here at the Air and Space Symposium this week, so thanks very much. So I'm gonna spend just a, a very short time uh, introducing a little bit to play off of what you just uh, talked about, was especially with smart weapons and the speed at which the Air Force and Guardians, but in this case it will mainly be talking about airmen, 
uh, that are working on the flight line, the speed at which they need to prepare aircraft to be able to deliver weapons. And we'll see if my clicker works here. There we go. So over the last decade that I've been on this side of the blue line on the industry side, and by the way, they're not all slimy contractors. There are actually a lot of people down on that first floor in the atrium in the exhibit hall that are really here to listen to what your requirements are and try to deliver those in the time that you need them. Just a little plug for some of those that aren't necessarily aware of that or haven't maybe wandered down into that hall. There's a lot of things to learn and a lot of things for you to impart there. But over the past 10 years, I've dealt with a lot of airmen uh, in the armament arena. And quite frankly, when I was on active duty, they took me out to bend wrenches on the jet now and then, but never really with the armament piece and seeing all the, the onerous amount of test equipment that they had. So I asked them along the way, what would you really like? Things like a small footprint by the jet. In other words, fewer boxes, but more capability in the boxes that they do bring out. Rugged and airman-proof equipment that didn't need to leave the flight line every six months to be calibrated and or fixed and be gone for sometimes up to three or four months. Reducing, reduced training requirements. In other words, they were thinking about multi-capable airmen a long time ago and the, the speed at which ACE needs to be executed so that you could go and be trained across multiple different systems using the same equipment as opposed to the traditional model of every MDS has its own separate set of test equipment. So commonality was something that they were thinking about for sure and not just at home drones, but when they were deployed to other locations. And they really wanted test equipment that would actually do functional tests of smart weapons, not using the, for the most part, test equipment that was fielded with the current legacy fourth generation aircraft back in the late 70s that has just been band-aided together or maybe replaced with a similar like commodity test set on the flight line. I said commodity for a reason, because that's how it's looked at in the acquisition world. And so they, they had a box that did certain things. They got a new box that did certain things with, that could be sustained. So they, they looked and said, well, do we have to keep going down that road? And we'd sure like to do faster setup and faster test times and be able to keep the data that we have so that we could use that thinking ahead to what you all are looking at today, how to use AI to do predictive maintenance. This is over the last 10 years. This wasn't in the last 10 months. And then they really wanted to be able to increase mission effectiveness with reliable equipment and things that could meet the sortie generation times. Things like combat turns are back again. They disappeared for a long time. So then enters agile combat employment. And with the work that we had done at Marvin Test Solutions over the past decade, uh, we started having people come around and look at our equipment and said, whoa, You've got a, an Agile Combat Employment or ACE enabler here where we've taken a lot of the capabilities and put them together, moving from the desirements of what the maintainers had on the previous slide, leading to actual requirements that could be written and actually achieved uh, and attained. And so when we looked at that, we said, well, let's break this out a little further. Common menu-driven intuitive type test equipment. And with some of the tests that were done over the past couple of years, Airmen who had never been trained were selected from the flight line to come over and use the equipment, and they were doing tests in sometimes 90% less time than the traditional equipment, having never been trained on it. I think that leads to a multi-capable airman when you can pull someone who's never been trained on that equipment and use it, which kind of goes along the lines of what the chief was talking about yesterday when General Brown said, we don't need to have someone that's certified, 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 not certified, where we make it very hard. You can break down the barriers if you have the right equipment. Unprecedented test times, and then lean support in that as you're moving multiple MDSs together in these tailored force packages to be able to have single common test equipment that could test all of them. That exists today. That exists today and can be moved rapidly with the C-130s that the PACAF commander talks about having at his disposal not C-17s in the future. So the footprint will be extremely, extremely important. So this is what the airmen have been saying, and this is what we're listening to and trying to feed back to them. So if you get a chance, stop by our booth 7716, and we'll show you some of what they were calling ACE enablers. I'll leave you with this uh, little bit of maybe fire up since it's after lunch. 
a little fire up uh, video if this all works. Here we go. Uh, something happened. Quick. There we go. Let's see if it'll play. I'll hit the click play and see if it goes. Maybe we'll get the folks over on the side to make it happen. It's not me. <laughs> well, if they can't do it, maybe we'll let the next speaker go and then they'll come back to it. Thank you. All right, we'll have some gratuitous explosions at the end. So uh, over to Snooze. Well, sir, I'm uh, also a fan of video. So what I thought I'd do today is voice over a three minute uh, video of lots of things uh, blowing up. So hopefully we'll uh, pick up the slack a little bit. Uh, I'm John Martin's call sign Snooze from uh, our MBDA DC's office. Um, MBDA is a global weapon manufacturer. We have uh, plants in uh, France, Italy, UK, Germany, Spain, and of course in the US. Um, have over 45 weapons in the inventory. Today I'm just gonna focus on two that are applicable to our toughest uh, theater we're about ready to look at, and that's the Indo-PACOM theater. Of course, the Indo-PACOM theater is especially stressing because it comes with that anti-access maritime battlefield, so makes the weapons uh, have to do things like all weather, uh, multiple moving target against ships that can defend themselves. So that tends to drive extended ranges and uh, smart seekers that can do um, basically a self-contained kill chain. So I'm gonna use two weapons to highlight that um, in a three minute video. Ideally, I've gotta prep the video a little bit because it'll come at you uh, really quickly. But the only thing I'd love you to walk away with is the message that, and it's kind of uh, cautiously optimistic, which is the US has a lot of uh, friends throughout the, uh, throughout the world. Uh, so we don't fight alone usually and so what I'd like you uh, to leave you with is the friends are going to show up with some pretty cool stuff and, and show up ready to fight so with that I'd love to jump right into what we call the spear missile but it's in development right now so I didn't have a lot of cool seeker video but it's uh, uh, brimstone's going to give us a good baseline so I'm going to show you what I uh, what I call the world's most underappreciated direct attack weapon the brimstone uh, for everybody to sync you up it's a lot like a hellfire or a jet except it's been stressed to go on fast moving uh, fighter aircraft so uh, that pull a lot of G's. You'll see there's a, a dual seeker on Brimstone. Um, Brimstone uh, has a millimeter wave so of course it can go to lat long and take out a piece of uh, uh, metal. Uh, it can also take out um, uh, uh, laser spots, but of course we're gonna talk about cooler stuff. This is what we do in Huntsville, Alabama. We build the Diamondback Wing Kit for uh, Boeing's STB-1, uh, built over 30,000 of them. But what you're gonna see now is brimstone in the dual mode. Um, dual mode, this is a, uh, in the desert against a really fast target, it's a small target. You see the laser spot is where the crosshair is, really messy, not on the target. So what the brimstone does is it turns on its millimeter wave radar, it says, I see what you want me to do, and it takes over in the end of the game. I got another shot against a similar target, also a, a motorcycle uh, clipping along in the desert. And again, notice the, the messy laser spot and it does its thing. Next I'm gonna show you is a column attack mode. A uh, fighter can carry 12 of these a piece. The launcher says U-12 missiles are gonna see the same thing. Brimstone one, you go after the first target. Brimstone two, you go after the second. Brimstone three, you go after the third. So basically a self-contained kill chain. I know you guys are all thinking of Ukraine. Uh, this is a great weapon for that uh, type theater. Uh, you all have seen the, the road of trucks. Brimstone also has an area attack mode very similar to the um, uh, column attack. In this case, it's an area. Brimstone do the same thing. They seek out the targets and kill them. High res millimeter waves, so it can tell the difference between track vehicles and wheeled vehicles, can tell exactly how big the target is it's going to attack. So there's a bunch of different ways you can make sure it doesn't kill the good guy boat. That was just to prep us for a spear. Uh, spear that's going to be coming up is uh, we've improved brimstone in almost every way. We put an air breather turbine um, instead of the solid rocket motor uh, and wings. So now on class it goes uh, beyond 90 miles. Think a tactical uh, cruise missile for those targets that don't warrant those large expensive cruise missiles, if you will. It's got a better seeker than brimstone, so everything you saw uh, is better on this one. Uh, better warhead as well, and of course long time of flight, you're gonna need a, a data link. It's got link 16. Um, it's a slow missile, so there's also a spear EW, so you can stick one of those in, uh, in an attack package like this to take care of the uh, weapons en route. 
So we're gonna continue the theme with another air breather. You need air breather for a confined stealth space to get a lot of energy in there. In this case, it's the Meteor air-to-air -air missile. Um, solid rocket motors have up to 80% volume as oxygen, so if you can get your oxygen from the outside, you can pack a ton more energy in these things. So in comparison to a similarly sized air-to-air -air missile, uh, this one will go three times further head-to-head, -head, five times further in a chase down. So if you have a 50-mile, uh, these are fake numbers, by the way, 50-mile uh, head-on shot would be 150 for Meteor. So you can imagine a uh, mixed load. All our coalition partners have the uh, world's best medium range missile as well, AMRAM. So imagine a mixed road, uh, load of two uh, Meteor, four AMRAM, two AIM-9 to clean up anything that's still living within 20 miles. So yeah, you can almost use F-35 and air superiority now in the same sentence. So with that, you know, I hit you real quick with that. Just uh, uh, hopefully you guys take away that, yeah, the coalition partners have a lot of cool stuff hanging out and they're gonna show up ready to contribute. Thank you so much for letting me uh, uh, be a part today. Yeah, thanks, News. And he's got a brochure as well. <laughs> okay, over to uh, Steve, please. I'll try and go a little bit quicker, I think. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the, the overview. I learned a lot, actually, from this. And I'm, I'm really... Um, really humbled to be on the stage with you guys. A lot of a lot of experience up here, so thank you for the invite and thank you for the opportunity here. So my, my name is Steve Milano. I am the uh, air to ground effects lead out of Tucson, Arizona. Um, so the the Stormbreaker weapon as well as Joint Strike missile uh, fall within my portfolio. Um, and I think we have a, a short video that we'll, we'll play. You may have seen it kind of in the lead up. So so it, it'll be a little bit of a recap here. So if we can roll that video. We'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll Air be dominance started. is critical in today's global threat environment. To stay one step ahead, Raytheon Missiles and Defense is advancing the capabilities of weapons like AMRAAM and Stormbreaker, with upgrades to AMRAAM hardware and software to enhance its range, maneuverability, and effectiveness against advanced threats. And the Stormbreaker Smart Weapon, network enabled to receive target updates in flight and readily integrated across a host of platforms. Raytheon missiles and defense. See short short videos. It's it's not a tip. It's just a recommendation. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Stormbreaker smart weapon. So I, I wanted to kind of lead with that as kind of the 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 stepping off point for a little bit of the conversation that hopefully we'll get into here is that we're, we're we reached IOC on the the F-15E. Um, and we're, we're in operational testing for the, the F-35B, uh, A and C to follow. Uh, obviously, a lot of interest in the capability on those platforms. But I, I really wanted to look at what are we, what are we focusing on within our air-to-air -air and air-to-ground effectors? And, and it's how do we evolve capability and capacity uh, today? And it's, it's leveraging our, our partners from, from the logistics trains after they're developed but also in the design phase. And so we, we've done a lot of work trying to digitize the life cycle of all of these, uh, these effectors. And so looking at the digital twinning on the early, early side is great and it's interesting and it, it gets us to an ability a lot faster, but that's just one piece. And I, and I like to say, mind the gap, right? Because when you go from one stage of the systems engineering V to the next, you, you, you're fraught with peril, right? And so we're really trying to focus in on how do we deliver capability without disrupting capacity in the current state. And so that's been something that we've been focusing on and trying to, to bring capability, not just to the U.S. warfighter, but partners and allies around the world. And, and it, it really is, a, it's been an interesting journey because it, it's not a single approach. And as soon as you bring uh, everyone into to the fold, it, it, you learn a lot more, but you also, uh, you also enable capability across across the spectrum. And so really we've been focusing across the air-to-air -air domain and air-to-ground uh, domain about uh, Raytheon Missiles and Defense is really focusing on how do you how do you get to that system integration perspective. And we, we've got a lot of history there. We've got a lot of history bringing systems to, to the forefront um, and, and just bringing those things together and bringing some suppliers, partners into, into the fray. So uh, looking forward to the conversation. Brilliant, thanks very much, Steve. And thanks to all three of you for some fascinating insights. So we saw a, a pretty impressive array of weaponry there um, right across the board. And obviously with um, modern weaponry, it takes quite a bit of time to, uh, to produce some of that, and, and especially at scale. So if we go back to one of the sort of first points that I brought up concerning our ability to produce and distribute weapons at scale. You know, is Tom Mankin right with his assumption 
Um, and if that is an, an issue, how do we get after this, both from a production and a logistics um, perspective, to be able to produce weapons at the scale they're going to be used at? And General, would you like to kick off with that one? Well, at the Marvin Group, we don't make anything that goes boom. <laughs> but you can't get the boom to the target without the things that come out of Marvin Engineering. In other words, the bomb racks, launchers, and the pylons. And I'll just give you an example of how you can scale up and move the speed of production when needed. Uh, about three years ago, it was discovered that there was an 18-month gap from the time of F-35s rolling off the flight line until the armament actually showed up. And when the government came to Lockheed, and Lockheed came to the Marvin Group, and they said, we need your help, within 18 months, they closed that gap from a cold start, ramping up what they had. So when things need to be done, you look back in history, like we heard yesterday, we've done this before. And I would tell you that Marvin Engineering hadn't done it before, but American industry had with our partners because there are four countries involved in the production of that armament beyond Marvin Engineering, and they made it happen. Brilliant. Snooze, is this something you've looked at at uh, MBDA as well, just in terms of uh, production times? Yeah, production times as well as I think what uh, uh, disappoints the warfighter as well, not only production delivery, but development as well. I know there's, there's some uh, lingering requirements holes, especially where we want to go fighting. And one of the things that frustrates, I, th I think, the, uh, the customer, uh, the warfighter, is that it takes uh, you know, a rough rule of thumb in our businesses, uh, 10 years and a billion dollars to develop a new weapon. And we need them yesterday. And, and they're not available yet. So if there is a way, I think, if we could accelerate that developmental time, um, if you don't, you're stuck with what's, what's available today or maybe small modifications or so. Um, but I will plug, again, the coalition partner theme is we're not going at this alone. And of course, there's production uh, overseas and, and other options available. So uh, that's, that's an immediate um, low-hanging fruit, as well as I'd love us to uh, fix the acquisition community that I grew up in, right? So I was, I was a part of the problem. Uh, but it's a tough problem, uh, rest assured, and I think we're looking at a daunting task of uh, uh, a theater that needs capabilities we don't necessarily have today, and we need a lot of weapons as well, so it's all coming together at once. Yeah, exactly. Steve? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a great point, and, and that's kind of where, where my head goes to as well, is that, you know, the stable, stable and dependable requirements and funding help build that resiliency into your logistics and supply chain. And so we all feel that pressure, whether it's you know, on the government side of acquisition or it's on the industry, defense industry side of acquisition, it, it, it is a pain point. It's something that we, 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 can, we can help work together as long as we you know, continue to have that, that uh, consistent conversation. But it's also looking at your capacity and logistics train as a system of systems, right? And, and I think that all too often we, we, we don't look at the, the, the total complexity of the logistics and capacity and how that plays in. We're starting to realize it because, because of the, the current situation we are in now globally. You look across where are your supply chains weakest, where, are they need, where do they need some resiliency built in, where you can, can you build in some of that dynamicism and, and, and actually have a benefit to the, the expenditure of some funds to, to create that resiliency in the supply chain. Part of that resiliency that you just mentioned is actually looking ahead and having the stocks that you need, especially as the Air Force looks at this ACE concept. You can't just move all this, these munitions around where you need them. So I think part of what's happened in the last year in world events has probably driven the planners to step back and go, where do we need to ensure across the coalition partners, as well as across the US, the stockpiles to be replenished or begun where they were never filled to begin with. Because you won't have time, given all of the challenges, the acquisition system's not gonna change overnight. We heard yesterday with some of the panelists, uh, with the, the startups and that sort of things, things are moving in the right direction, but that's taken quite a few years to get moving, and the big acquisition process is not totally that rapid and agile yet. And so stockpiling to be enable to be able to conduct the war wherever you are. Moving the airplanes is fast. Moving weapons is not. 
Yeah, so uh, General, you, you brought my mind to the resource uh, section both of you guys did, which is there's very few problems you can't make go away with without, uh, you know, uh, by not throwing, you know, throw a little money and you can make uh, almost any problem go away. But now what do you do when you have multiple different areas you have to address, stockpiles, new weapons, uh, and, and there is a challenge, right, I guess, so. And, you know, we've seen quite a few panels today already talking about speeding up the acquisition process. Um, but then also talking about digital design and, and digitalization across the manufacturing process. If we had to put emphasis on technology or process, which one would you plunk for? Right, both, uh, <laughs> if that makes sense. But, but you know, you, you did uh, talk about uh, a lot of the things that the acquisition community is going after in a good way, which is um, why can't we make these weapons modular where if you want to um, uh, replace the back end, uh, you can do that by simply plugging and playing and, and, and having more of a, uh, a consistent common architecture that you can mix and match and, and play and maybe mix uh, vendors as well. So I, I think the acquisition community is going at it the right way, but it, uh, it's, it's a slow process. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. You, you, you have to do both. Right, it, the, the process can change incrementally, but you can't wait for the process to change. You have to, you have to bring you know, the, the material solutions to bear and the engineering to bear uh, in the current process, and, and, and that'll help us evolve. And, and so those processes can enable us to get the most out of digital engineering, digital acquisition uh, processes that we're, we're well entrenched in, but we need to acknowledge where there's shortfalls. You know, there, there's a, the, the example that I use is that we've got completely digitized factories, right? Very low touch points and, and we've got, you know, uh, robots moving equipment around the floor. And all of our material supply systems are fully integrated and so you can see where the material is coming in and out of the factories. Um, and I walk in one day and I see a whiteboard and they're writing in exactly, you know, this, this is the shift, this is how many were done at this shift. And I was like, well, what happened to the digitized board? He's like, well, this is faster. Uh, okay, well, that, that's, where, that's where process didn't really catch up with technology or they didn't get it quite right, the technology didn't get it quite right, and the process needed to, to amend. And so we need that flexibility back and forth, and I, I think the answer, again, is, is both. Great. Super. Let's um, move on to um, another theme that I want to address. And I, I discussed briefly about what China and Russia are doing with regards to uh, new weapons at the moment. Um, experimentation with hypersonics, which Putin has obviously um, gone out publicly and said that he has been using. It's questionable whether they are hyper or not. Um, so, you know, are they really catching up or are they ahead in certain areas? You know, and what are the implications of fielding such weapons uh, on the battlefield? So, Snooze, do you want to? kick that one off? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the hypersonics is, is uh, obviously the uh, uh, an area where we're expending a lot of resources for good reasons. Very hard to defend against something uh, coming in that fast, of course. Um, uh, there are a lot of challenges, I think, what you're alluding to um, when something's going that fast, not only material-wise, but um, communicating sensors on the weapon or so. So there is, it is yet to be seen how effective those weapons are, and maybe um, equally as important is countering those, those weapons and having the technologies uh, uh, to do that. Um, but rest assured, um, we in the uh, acqui uh, industry side and the acquisition uh, side, we do tend to... Um, uh, Occasionally we fall asleep at the wheel and we wake up and we find, huh, how come they have this and we don't have that? And uh, uh, the good news is we usually respond pretty quickly. I think we did a couple of years ago and, and hopefully and almost always those gaps um, uh, do close. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, it's unclear how, how effective those are going to be, but it is a problem that we have to address. And, oh, by the way, why don't we have uh, a, a better arsenal is the question that we're all asking as taxpayers. Yeah, and I'll say it, it kind of brings brings to the forefront the, the necessity for a layered defense approach, right? You, we understand the threat that, that hypersonic weapons present, offensive hypersonic pre weapons present, and that's leading to, uh, I guess, a lean forward approach from the, the missile defense agents, from the Air Force, from a resiliency in that space-based that space -based sensing layer as well as uh, domestic and, and uh, indigenous uh, missile defense capabilities against hypersonic threats, but the ability to, to sense them, the, the ability to, to engage them is, is critically important, but it also, it also tips the hand a little bit, right? I mean, the, the, all of those tests show 
what's what's in play and physics are are what they are and so it's a it's a good it's a good tell to be able to see what's what's happening on the world stage what that development looks like and so I don't necessarily, uh, personally, me personally, I, I don't see it as a, a as incredibly alarming when I see a news article. I see it as a data point, and are we responding appropriately? Are we are we using that calculus to adjust our approach to from an offensive and defensive capability perspective? It's not it's not a one off. Uh, do we match capability for capability? It's a balance. I think the good news that we tend to overlook is that uh, 12 to 20 years ago, we had a lot of, of work going on in hypersonics. And then for a period of time, leading up to uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, that was put on ice. But we learned a lot uh, over those, uh, that decade and a half or so ago on hypersonics. Now that there's emphasis back on it, we're not starting from a cold start. And I think it is an unknown as to how capable the, uh, the China and the Russian hypersonic weapons are, but the fact is they are uh, exploring that ar arena, and they're actually using some of those weapons uh, today. And so I think we're gonna find with the entrepreneurial spirit of the United States uh, across small and large industries that there's a lot of work being done, and I think we will catch up and accelerate past wherever anyone else is today sooner than later working across our, with our partners and coalition partners as well, who are also working in that arena. Great, well, that, that's reassuring at least. You know, just, we talked about hypersonics, but what else would you see as being a disruptive capability that's potentially around the corner um, with regards to weapons and munitions? Steve, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, so I, I guess in the, the, the cyber domain and in, and in the, uh, the networked autonomy domain, uh, where we're leaning forward, the things that, that we're seeing kind of uh, from, from a mass scale, it's all about data uh, and how, much, how fast can you process that data. And there, there's a lot of areas around the world, there's a, specifically, you know, our adversaries in, in China, they have a, an ability to source data at a, at a greater scale. And so what we really have to look internally and think about where, where are we applying uh, our resources, because we, we've got brilliant, brilliant people in, 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 in this country and in, in our, our partner nations um, that, that we can come up with those algorithms that can, de that can be deployed in our systems of systems to really make the capability uh, eye-watering. But it's only as good as the data that we can feed through it. And so we need to be, uh, we need to be innovative about where we come up with those data sources. If it's a munition, we've got terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes of, of data of, of flight testing uh, between our companies that, that we, can, we can bring to bear. Are we using that appropriately? And so that, that, those, that's the area that kind of concerns me the, the most is are we applying all of our resources to this autonomy challenge uh, and, and is it going to, are, are, we, are we keeping pace because it's, a, it's, less, it's less clear than, than a, a hypersonic weapon. It's a, it's a little bit uh, of a, a nebulous space. You know, carrying that, uh, that, that theme further, our processing power is crazy right now and our ability to crunch data and deal with data as well. Um, an area that I think could be a game changer is, is the uh, uh, making the weapons do the hard work. Um, the, the missile we showed you, the brimstone, it had a uh, 700 combat shots and a 98% success rate, which means it's aircrew proof, right? And I think we need more of that, meaning the weapons, the UAVs, the autonomy, um, it just simply can um, uh, think faster. The technology exists to think faster and make better decisions uh, if we program them right. I think it's fair to say that force on force is not what we're gonna face tomorrow. And asymmetric type threats and attacks are certainly there. And so in the cyber arena, things that were taken for granted that we don't have to worry about it in the past. Any software that gets there anywhere near a flight line or a missile site or satellite production area, all that software needs to be NIST certified. And if it's not today, it needs to be tomorrow because a lot of disruption can happen well, through software attacks, whether a traditional cyber attack that we read in the Wall Street Journal or something that happens with someone on a flight line that you never suspected would happen kind of like a twin tower attack. Yeah, as if by magic, um, General, you've perfectly segued into my next uh, question, which was gonna be um, around that asymmetric aspect. You know, we talked a little bit about Ukraine earlier on, which 
um, you know, you're seeing a very different use and very different approach um, by both sides in that conflict. So, uh, you know, what lessons would you say we are garnering from, uh, from that battle so far with regards to precision versus mass or delivery versus effect, for example? Well, I think they got my video working, and it might be a good introduction. Let's watch some stuff below. To up, one of the biggest to, uh, lessons learned. Everyone. Did you get the video working? All right, we there we go. There Let's we go. go ahead and hit play on that. This is why you don't want to mass armor on a road. Just wait for it. We're not done yet. Now we're done. But this is why you don't want to mass armor on a road. And, and what did everyone fear in Ukraine? The massive armor, it's all moving to the south. Well, with some of the weapons from the gentleman to my left uh, that were employed and, and weapons from others, that column became one of the world's largest targets at the time. Yeah, so uh, question asymmetric type piece. In, uh, yeah, so yeah. sort of mass versus uh, precision and, and delivery versus effect. You know, we're seeing grenades being dropped through um, the turrets of tanks um, uh, and from a commercial drone that's bought. Right on, for yeah. Example. So we're making incredible advances in the areas that, that we're talking about um, and we're becoming reliant on it. So it'd be real easy to... Um, uh, uh, if you can take away some of those tools, we're starting to, for, to rely on the computer power, computers, the self-targeting, that sort of thing. And sometimes something as simple as a, a gun can do some some neat work, and it's hard to be uh, full. Or a right? javelin. There you go. Or a, a javelin. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Thanks for the plug there. <laughs> javelin and Stinger doing the job, and and it's a it's a great uh, stepping off point from from where my where my thought process goes on this this topic is that. We've got existing capability that's being used in novel ways, and that innovation and the, 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 you know, that approach is necessary on the battlefield. And so you're seeing a lot of, the, a lot of systems that would be quote unquote legacy systems being used in new ways, ways that you know, we didn't anticipate that they'd be used, but that's, that's what warriors do. We innovate. When the need is there, we, we get the job done with the tools that we have. And so what that, what that brings me to is, you know, when we look at the, the, the digital engineering infrastructure and what that's doing to accelerate capability to the field and accelerate development and production timelines, it's also giving you the flexibility and the modularity to be able to scale up and scale down because in one fight you may need that exquisite capability to be able to, to survive and get to, to the threat and, and eliminate it. And in another, you may be plinking tanks on a 40 mile convoy and, and you don't need that same capability. So you wanna know what is your cost effective way of doing that. And if you've engineered a solution that you can scale up and scale down in the same form factor and you can put that together on the flight line, that's capability that's going to endure because it grows with the mission set. Thank you. And you know, as we enter our last uh, couple of minutes here, just one sort of final question um, for a quick response to, if I may. Um, we've talked about a lot about, over the last uh, day and a half about integrated by design, and interoperability is, is, is a sort of key factor with this, and we've seen lots of different uh, Western systems being strapped to uh, Ukrainian aircraft at the moment. If we want to get after integrated by design from a weapons system perspective, um, how do we go about getting after that issue um, and get some commonality across uh, allies and partners? General. There's probably some lessons from, uh, from the past that are worth pulling up again, and that was a an exercise that was held throughout NATO in the 80s called Ample Gain, where aircraft would move from one base where they were assigned to another base with total different airmen from another country being able to maintain, gas them up, and load weapons. Well, in order to do that, you've got to get away from multiple different sets of test equipment because this is not affordable in today's world. So if you can actually get to common, expandable, well into the future test equipment, Whatever weapons come up tomorrow can be tested today and, and in the future. And that's one way to do it so that you make multi-capable airmen across the coalition, not just in your own Air Force. Common platforms as well, F-35, almost everybody's flying that on the, on the good guy side or so. So uh, the weapons, um, uh, even coalition weapons going in block four or so, it's another way we show up and you just know what the other folks are, are doing and thinking. 
Yeah, I, I have to agree that the common test equipment, common logistics train, it's very important as we field our weapons. If you have a unique logistics footprint that you're needing to adapt to, that, that's a very challenging thing for, for us as a contractor to be able to plan for and help work with, to, to satisfy by your mission space. But also, uh, commonality across waveforms, commonality across interfaces, U, UAIs, uh, UI compliance is a big thing, so having F-35 is, is big, but uh, across multiple platforms is also important as well. And so if there's some commonality and discussion points to be able to drive towards common waveform, common interfaces. Brilliant, and thank you very, very much, gentlemen, for a fascinating insight into uh, the future challenges we have with uh, weapons and munitions. It's encouraging to hear that you're thinking ahead and we're, we're gonna be doing something about it to uh, stay at, at the front end of our game. So ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to join me in uh, thanking the panel for a fascinating conversation. <laughs>